So firstly, I want to introduce our guest speakers for the evening and give you a quick overview. So firstly, our Executive Director for Oxfam New Zealand, Rachel Lemazure, will talk to us briefly about her experience as a past trail walker. We will then jump straight into a presentation by myself, covering everything you need to know about Event Weekend. We'll then jump straight into our guest speakers. So we have two guest speakers with us tonight. We have John Loftus. So him and Oxfam Trail Walkers have a really long standing relationship going back to 1991 uh, when he did his first 100Ks event in Adelaide, South Australia. So most of the 16 events that he's done since have been here in New Zealand, which is where he's been living for about 10 years. And so Taranaki will be his 17th. He's going to be in touch a little bit more later um, in this info session. And lastly, we have Marco uh, from, from our sponsor, Outwear. So he's going to run us through how to wear all important buff and the many different ways to wear them. So if you have a buff handy or near you from previous years, then I suggest you grab one ready to test it with Marco later in the session. All questions will be at the end. Right, let's get straight into it. Um, is, I can't actually see Rachel. Oh, no, nope, there she is. I see her. So Rachel, I'd like to invite you to say a few words welcoming you all here tonight and I'll pop myself on mute. Uh, Kylie, thank you. And tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Co Rachel Limassuri, Tene, as Kylie's just said, and I'm the Executive Director of Oxfam New Zealand and have the honour of um, welcoming you to our, um, along with Kylie, to our second information event um, and also to share a little bit about what Oxfam is and then a lot about my excitement about Oxfam Trail Walker. So the first thing is, you know, Oxfam New Zealand, we are an international NGO, but we are a born and bred New Zealand charity. So this is very much much uh, homegrown New Zealand uh, outfit and we have joined as a member of a global Oxfam confederation which has 20 different Oxfams around the world right now. Um, many of you, those of you who've traveled overseas, particularly to the UK, might know about Oxfam Great Britain. Well, they're our big sister. They're the biggest sister. And in the family, we're the smallest little Oxfam, but we're very proud and I think we are pretty dynamic uh, Oxfam and, and part of that global network. And what do we do? So we do three things, but we do them in a very woven way that in many ways, we feel is the best way to, to drive change and, and, and get a better world for everyone. So the first thing we do is we respond to humanitarian disasters and particularly with uh, uh, our colleagues in the Pacific. So whether that was the, uh, the volcanic eruption in Ambai for Vanuatu, uh, the cyclones that we have seen through, come through Cyclone Winston, Cyclone um, Pam, uh, but most significantly for all of us is also what the impact of COVID-19 is being both for the Pacific and for countries like Timor-Leste where we work, as well as at a, at a far larger scale around the world. So we respond to humanitarian um, disasters. We also uh, work very closely with people in, in local communities who are facing injustice, whether that is having to adapt to climate change when they've had you know, zero emissions of carbon over the last couple of decades, or whether they're looking at the types of economic injustice that has forced them into poverty and are struggling to be able to pay for the schooling and for health needs of their family. So it's very much about what do they feel that they need to be able to do to challenge some of those systems that are keeping them where they are. And then the third piece that we do is that we work um, with our supporters and encouraging our government, our New Zealand government, to, in its global role. And we, again, think it's a very significant role that the New Zealand government has had over the years um, and particularly around uh, some of the, the global treaties around climate change and, and as well as uh, economic injustice such as tax evasion and uh, particularly a focus on the injustices that hold many women and girls back um, all around the world. So we weave all of that together because we feel that it's, we don't want to be just the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. We don't actually don't want to be just the fence at the top of the cliff. We think we need to be working alongside people as far back from the cliff as possible to avoid those being pushed to that cliff edge. So that's that's what we do as Oxfam. And the last bit, I know Kylie will be counting me down at this point, is Oxfam Trail Walker. 
I think it's one of the best fundraising events, if not the best fundraising event in the country. Um, I did it in 2016, in fact, when we first moved to Fakatane, and it was a massive weather bomb, actually. Huge amount of water, and I know that um, there will be others who remember that, but it was, a, it was a really amazing event, and I'm so proud of what I was able to achieve with my three team members. We came over that finish line. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely a challenge. And when I say to all of you, it's not a walk in the park, and I, those of you who've done it already, you know exactly what I mean, but it's also incredible achievement. You will go, go away from the, the weekend knowing that you've done a momentous thing for yourself personally, but as a team, and you've done a heap for um, the world that we want to have as, as all of us. So I want to particularly, I think, say, celebrate um, the way that it, it symbolizes for me how we all together are interconnected, whether it's our interdependency of each other and that team, um, the way that all the teams, you'll, you'll find this, those of you who have done it before, there's a lot of camaraderie. It's a real lovely moment when you're walking alongside each other on, on, the, on the trail itself. But your support crew are so crucial. They are absolutely essential, and you're going to know that. But also the way in which we work closely with the, with the Taranaki communities, with the iwi, with the district council, it's really a, a collective effort, and it's phenomenal how that comes together. And, and with lots of volunteers that we have as well. For me, therefore, it represents what, what we believe in at Oxfam, which is the manaki, the connectedness that we have, um, our responsibilities to each other, our responsibilities to others around the world who have less than we have, but are doing all that they can to make a better world for their children and their children's children. So it's enough from me, Kylie, and I'm really happy to take questions. Um, uh, and I'm also just thanking you all for what an amazing uh, commitment you already made. I know you'll be training, you're looking forward to it. It's going to be awesome. So kia ora to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And yep, I'll iterate if anyone has any questions specifically for her, pop them in the chat box um, and we'll get to them at the end of the session. For now, let's jump straight into the info session. So I'm going to share my screen um, and hopefully if it works. Yes, share. Okay. Can you see a big screen? Wonderful. Awesome. All right. Well, um, welcome again to the info session. Um, we're going to go, oh, we're going straight forward. I want to get you all excited straight away, um, not only for this info session, um, but for the event itself. Uh, so Taranaki is such a beautiful region and the New Plymouth District Council are really excited to have us all there. So I'm going to play this video and then we're going to jump straight into what, is, what we're going to cover for this evening. Beautiful. All right. What will we cover tonight? So we're going to go over the destination and the wonderful things you can do in Taranaki. The weekend timeline overview, so key dates and times you need to know. Registration information, start line expectations, checkpoints and what you'll need to know going into them. Terrain and trail, so our trail is yet to be released, but we will run over what to expect with the terrain support crew and why they are important, compulsory gear, finish line expectations like the awards ceremony atmosphere experience, and finally sustainability. 
So as you can see, plenty to fly through. So first of all, the destination. So for the first time ever, we're really excited to host Oxham Trail Walker in the beautiful Taranaki region. So judged by Lonely Pla Pal Planet as one of the world's top two regions to visit in their Best in Travel 2017 awards, Taranaki has so much to offer and we agree. So from museums to nature walks, surfing, culture and cuisine, it fits into everyone's ideal version of a weekend away. It's unique, it's legendary and it's impressive. We know you'll love it. So on the weekend, if you're sticking around for a few extra days before or after the event, we suggest heading into New Plymouth City area and exploring all they have to offer. So the weekend timeline overview. So the first day, the Friday, the 19th of March, this is the compulsory registration. So the time of registration opening and closing is still to be decided. However, this will be released on social and you'll receive emails leading up to the event with this information. So make sure you keep an eye on your spam and junk folders too. Saturday the 20th of March. So the ta start times are currently being adjusted as we are looking at doing starting waves. These will begin from 6 a.m. So details on this will be confirmed a little bit later. Teams will be coming in from about 4 to 5 p.m. on the Saturday, all the way up to Sunday midday. And then finally, the Sunday, the 21st of March, the award ceremony, which you should all be a part of, it's such a good vibe, will be at the finish line at 12 p.m. Registration. So all four team members um, and a minimum of one support crew must be present to pick up event packs. The registration is incredibly important and compulsory for all team members and a minimum of one support crew. Please ensure that, you tra that your travel plans fit around arriving at registration. Even though times for this is yet to be decided, last year we had a registration open from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. This should give you an idea on when to travel into Taranaki and give you enough time to go into registration. At registration on the Friday the 19th of March, you will receive walker directions, so these must be carried by you on the trail, your bib for event weekend, and any eligible fundraising rewards. If you have any team changes or have any team queries to make before the Saturday morning, this is the place to do it, so you'll be directed to a help desk to sort you out. Start line expectations. So the first thing is expect to get to the start line early. This year is likely going to be our biggest Oxfam trail walkie yet, so avoid any traffic issues and delays by arriving early. The second thing is prepare your gear the night before. So there's nothing worse than stumbling around in your accommodation at four in the morning trying to find your other sock. Make sure everything is ready to go and packed for the weekend. This could even mean pinning your bib onto the front of your shirt so you don't need to worry about it Saturday morning. Your support crew should also know the plan for checkpoints and what you need from them. Everyone will be pumped on adrenaline and the atmosphere will be buzzing. Soak it in. You're only going to be at the start for a short while before you're off. Take plenty of photos and remember the amazing feeling of beginning your walking journey. But also, you might be nervous or just excited to start. That's okay too. Expect that your bodies will react differently. Embrace it. Checkpoints. So the checkpoints are the perfect chance to catch up with your support crew, sit down to stretch and get off your feet for a little bit and eat some well-deserved oh, food. Really awesome. okay. right. Sorry, if, you're, if you've just joined us, make sure you pop yourself on mute. Wonderful, thank you. So these checkpoints are roughly between 15 and 20 kilometers apart from each other. And yes, port loos will be available at each checkpoint. You'd be surprised how many people ask that leading up to an event. So yes, port loos are available at each checkpoint. Make sure you check in and check out with the volunteer as you enter and exit. So every member in the team must do this. If you don't, it will register in our system that you haven't reached the checkpoint. And it's the time to meet your lovely support crew. It's really nice seeing your close supporters through the trail. Let them know what you need prior to event weekend. So when they turn up to greet you, they are prepared with exactly what you need. And the last thing is recover and refuel. So checkpoints are the perfect time to refuel as well as areas to sit down and recover for a few minutes. 
Support crew can scout out the checkpoints, set up some chairs and have a hot cuppa waiting for you when you arrive. So we suggest you don't hang around long, however, as your muscles will seize. 10 to 15 minutes is perfect. The trail and terrain. So I'm sure we'll get plenty of questions about the trail, um, as we always do. And it's often the one that we get the most hype around leading up to event weekend. So the trail for our 2021 event is still being built currently with our small team going down to audit the trail in mid-October. Even though I can't tell you much about the trail just yet, I can say that the terrain will be extremely varied, including dock land, private farmland, forestry and bush, beach and rocky shore, and hard pack trails. The list will go on. We'll be releasing the trail in October, along with elevation information and checkpoint distance information. Support crew, we're flying through these, we're flying them. So your support crew are your lifelines. They are super important to get you across the finish line. Their main job is to meet you at checkpoints. They are there to support you and give you things you need, such as food, extra hydration, walking poles, or even spare shoes and socks. You must have your support crew signed up under your team, just like your team members, prior to event weekend. The minimum is two, both must be 18 years and over. Very soon, we'll be releasing more support crew information on our website. This will include personalized checklists for support crew and advice how to navigate checkpoints. Lastly, support crew can be included in your weekend team trainings. So start them early in your training plan and ensure they know what you need from them during the walk. Do they need to learn how to give you foot massages? Or have you learnt that you crave pizza while out on the trail? No matter how strange it is, their job is to ensure you get through the trail. So don't forget to give them love through the journey as well. What gear do you need? So this is also a very common question, what gear? All team members will receive a prep guide in their welcome pack with Bivouac Outdoor gear tips when they register. If you've already registered, we sent out our first batch of welcome packs a couple of weeks ago. So the next batch will be November this year. In the meantime, you can view the prep guide on our website under preparation. Here are a few key points. A comfortable day pack. Support crew will transport the bulk of your food and gear. All teams, regardless of distance, should prepare to walk in the dark. So a head torch is highly recommended. Trial different shoes and socks during training as well. So you want to go into the event weekend with no surprises. And then on the right there, you've got your compulsory items. So you have your bib, so please wear this on the front of your shirt. Your walker directions, so all teams need to have these with them on the trail at all times. Your first aid kit, a survival blankets, two mobile phones, preferably two different networks are, are ideal. Um, reflective clothing, whistle and water. Bivouac Outdoor is also currently working on a gear list for you all, so we'll be releasing that very soon on our website and social. And then we have the finish line expectations. So you've walked your 50 kilometers, you've walked your 100 kilometers, you're feeling sore, but the finish line, I promise, will be an amazing atmosphere and there will be nothing like it. There will be so many different emotions and feelings going around, much like the start line, embrace it. So firstly, you're going to be sore. Ensure you stretch when you're done and make sure you drink plenty of fluids to help you recover. Take plenty of photos, especially with your hard-earned medal. Post them online and tag Oxfam Trailwalker NZ and include the hashtag OTWNZ. There will also be a glass of bubbles waiting for you at the end, thanks to Booster Wine Group, your medal and a sausage chisel. So it'll be time to celebrate. This is also a really good time to mention that if your team raises $3,000 before event weekend, you'll be eligible for a special VIP finish line experience. The details for this reward will be released a little bit later, um, closer to the event. Also make the most of being a tourist for the day. So take in the local seaside market, which will be happening at the same time next door around Sunday midday. And lastly, 
the awards ceremony will be held around the same time, Sunday at 12 p.m. If you finish sooner, come back to the finish line to be a part of the experience and cheer on the teams finishing their walks. Lastly, I wanted to touch on sustainability. So Oxfam Trailwalker aims to walk the talk this year by demonstrating Oxfam New Zealand's commitment to environmental sustainability. We aim to minimise the negative environmental effects of our event in every way possible. An important focus for Oxfam Trailwalker 2021 is major reduction of single-use plastic bags, packaging, carpooling, and continuing to be a disposable cup-free event. In the past, Oxfam Trailwalker has had an estimation carbon output of 108 tonnes. We are actively working to reduce this considerably and need your help. So during the event, we'd love if you could dispose of all of your rubbish and separate recycling and landfill rubbish. Pack your food in reusable containers. This would be a good thing to let your support crew know as well. Carpool where possible and sustainable decorations. So we encourage support crew to think outside the box. So maybe create a homemade sign to cheer on your team with things lying around your home. Reuse and recycle. We are in the midst of putting our sustainability report on our website. So watch this space for more quick wings and watch what your help means to us. And on to our legend. So that's it from us. I know I threw heaps of information at you. I'm sure some of you may, may have taken notes, but if you've just joined us, we are recording this session. So if you would like to watch it later, it will be on our Facebook and um, website as well. So again, if anyone has just joined us, I am going to pass it on to our first guest speaker, John Loftus. Um, so he has taken part in Oxfam Trail Walker for 17 years now, being one of our long lasting legends. He's taken part in not only here in New Zealand, but globally, which is a massive achievement. So he's going to talk a little bit about his experience in the past and touch on some key things to remember for the event. So I'm going to put myself on mute. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And John, if you would like to take it away, yep. go for it. Thanks, Kylie. And good night, everyone. For those that didn't hear, um, my name again is John Loftus. I first got involved with the event back in 91 in Adelaide. I've got 10 minutes. And when I was asked to talk to you all, I thought, what can I share with you over almost 20 years? And I've just got it down to three subjects or headings. And the first one is about crossing the finishing line. What was it like and what condition have I been in? Then there's just getting through the tough parts of the trail and, and then some tips for the weekend. So, so as you've just heard, uh, Taranaki will be my 17th and you've got to be thinking, wow, um, why would someone be crazy enough to do that? And at that, what I want to say to that is where you're at right now, for most of you that if this is your first time, is exactly where I was 19 years ago. And that first event was the most memorable. It was also the most difficult and no holding back that I did get blisters. It took me four or five days to recover, but it was memorable because of the way we approached it. So right from the get go, I'm going to talk about planning. So having a plan for the day, having a plan for the training is why we achieved our goal of 24 hours that year. Um, then there was the, so I'm not going to go through all 16 of them, but so the first one most memorable and the key there was planning. The fastest, so about 10 years ago my daughter through a challenge to me, she said, Dad, you're always coming in around the 22, 24. Why don't you break, go for the 20, break 20 hours? So I almost recruited, if you like, three young guys, a lot younger than me. Um, and together we trained mainly in the Hillary's out of Auckland. And we got in just, just over 19 hours. Again, that's memorable because of the effort. And as I'm getting older, um, I'm actually getting some pretty cool results. So again, planning was a big part of that. And that one, the fastest, I had the quickest recovery, like I was good almost the next day. 
and no blisters. So go figure that, the, the fastest event got the best or the quickest recovery. Again, it comes back to planning. The slowest, yes, I've been 28, 30 hour finishes twice, and both of them are memorable. I think it was Rachel that mentioned uh, the weather bomb in Fakatane. that was our first year down there, and we survived it. Uh, the memory there was my son and my daughter were in that team. My wife, I'm going to mention shortly, um, she was very much part of the support crew. So just getting through that and the four of us crossing the line was most memorable. Um, and I've already alluded to family. I know your families are going to be involved, support crew, maybe walking with you. And you're making memories, you're creating memories together and uh, just awesome. So. They're just a few of the highlights or memorable uh, finishes that I've had. The feeling, I mean, physically, of course, you spent that year that I did my fastest. I actually had a little bit of um, fuel in the tank, and it's good to have some for the massage. There's a massage tent. I'm assuming it's going to be there this year, Kylie. Um, make use of that. So, so there's just a few points about the finishing line. Now getting through, getting through the, I was asked to talk about getting through the physically tough bits. And I've dropped physical because I'm saying this event, and this is my view, you'll talk to other people, they might have slightly different views. I'm just sharing what's worked and what hasn't worked for me. I say 60% of this is mental. 40%, you've still got to do the hard yards with your training, but when you get, and it's also in three parts, getting to the halfway mark, I'm not gonna say it's, it's easy, but it, it's the easiest part of the walk. And um, then there's the next, the second stage after you've left a hot meal and got changed and you get to about the 75K mark. Now you're going into the zone of what in the hell have I done? What was I thinking when they tricked me into this? And it's good to acknowledge that that's coming and when it arrives and then together you can talk it that the the dark cloud or whatever you want to call it uh, has arrived and we're going to get through this and then of course that last 10 or so k i actually find quite um that's where the determination steps up so so there's just a few things that um happen that you know why do people withdraw I think this was covered in the first session. It's mainly blisters, uh, sore knees, mainly from going downhill. So you've got six months to prep your body. So what can you do to prevent blisters? And what can you do to prevent knee injury is um, very much worth investigating and practicing. I'm going to give you a few tips of what we do on the day. Um, plan the walk, walk the plan. It sounds like I'm super organized, but I'm one that would rather not be out there for the full 36 hours. I like around about the 24. You need a plan and so does your support crew. Agree on, and I'm gonna hold this up. Um, this is the, and it arrived again or in the email today, but this is an awesome little booklet and the resources apart from this that are available online Going back to 91, it's come a long, long way, not just in New Zealand, but also back in Australia and other places. So have a look at that. This actually gets you to question, what's your purpose or what's your vision for this event? That could be a team vision. It could be a personal purpose of why you're doing it. Um, okay, I'm mindful of time, so I'll just skip along a little bit. Okay, so when the body, at that plus 50K or the 25K, and you're starting to go to that dark spot, and the body's aching, what I found is focus on what's working. What part of the body, and perhaps the mind, is actually working? And this is an, an act of being grateful or thankful. Hey, the toes, the left foot's working. And surprise, surprise, 10, 15 an hour later, what you were worried and concerned about, it's somehow no longer an issue. And I'm not talking about serious injury, but that is probably my biggest tip in terms of working the mind over the body. 
The support crew, huge part they can play. And again, their plan, you don't want to keep them up for the whole 24 something hours. So think about how you can rest them and utilize them. Distractions of some sort. Um, again, we had our support crew come out about the 70K mark dressed up in silly stuff, but it got us lifted our spirits and really got us laughing. An umbrella and a pole. I'm actually, umbrella is relatively new. That's what the weather bomb in Fakatane did to me. It caused me to bring out an umbrella for protection. But in the last couple of years, it also has helped with sun. So the radiant heat from the sun is another one that, that um, you can forget, about, you know, you can perhaps not take too much notice of. And the last bit about a tip is a roller. So during your training, you know, and as the distances get longer, then uh, you're building up the lactic acid and rolling those parts of the body, the legs, um, very, very good to keep the legs where you want them. All right, I've got about two minutes left. So the tips for the weekend. Now remember you're creating memories, so you want it to be fun. Um, expect the unexpected. So even though you have a plan, a plan B, even a plan C, it's a classic, not, it's not what happens to you, it, it's how you respond to what happens. And you wanna create wonderful memories. Um, yeah, I actually made a little note that you won't forget, the, you'll forget the time, but you'll never forget the memory, right? Some, some of you might wanna hang on to that time, but actually it's crossing the line and having that memory of, and hopefully the four of you together. Eating and drinking, you see a lot of people get sick along the way and when you talk to them, they didn't drink enough, they didn't eat when they should have. Massage, if I haven't already, I mentioned massage. The last month or two before and afterwards, walking poles I've mentioned, um, manage or oh, swelling. So a thing I picked up about oh, six or seven years ago is that checkpoints are every second, wash your feet, even though you might not think they're dirty, wash them, I ice them and elevate them. Swelling. I have an extra size shoe. That little cavity is for swelling and a little bit of movement. If you get blisters, you've got a bit of room, but hopefully you can avoid blisters. And then the last thing for me is, is just to encourage others. You've got your own team to encourage. You're going to be connecting with other teams, hopefully, no lost walkers out there, but encourage others. Be so thankful for everyone that's got you to where you've got to. Be thankful to our volunteers and the Oxfam staff. And um, yeah, so that's my little 10 minute of almost 20 years doing this event and I'll keep doing it for as long as I can. Next year will be my 15th hundred and I've done two fifties. Kylie, back to you. Thank you, John. Wow, <laughs> you have so much knowledge. That little tip about the um, elevating your feet and icing them, fantastic, awesome. Um, so thank you for talking about your experience. Um, you have so much wisdom to share, so I'm really glad that you were able to um, join us tonight. So we're gonna pass it over to Marco. So he's our outwear representative. Uh, and he's going to talk a little bit about the all-important buff, which is the reward your team will receive once you reach your 2,000 fundraising target. Um, also, as a side note, just before we jump in, we have a little special surprise to mention to everyone after this, so sit tight for that. However, I would like to say now that if you shop online for Outwear, um, on Outwear, sorry, 20% um, of your purchase will be credited to your fundraising page, so definitely get on board with that. Anyways, if you've got a buff nearby, grab it handy and I'm going to pass it over to you, Marco. Go for gold. Thanks, Kylie. Hi, everyone. Um, if you do have your buff, um, just raise it up so I can see you have one. Has anyone got this? No? Okay, I'll quickly just do a demonstration and tell you a little bit about the product. So um, every year we do a customized design. Um, and um, the new product or the new fabric, um, it's made of recycled plastic bottles. So um, Buff is really um, working towards sustainability and um, the product is made of re um, two recycled plastic bottles. It's got a two-way stretch. It's got UPF of 40, um, so really good sun protection. 
if it's really hot, this will keep you cool. And if it's um, um, really cold out there, this will keep you warm, even when it's wet. So I'll just show you a few um, different ways of wearing it. So you can just wear it around the neck. I've never done this sitting down, so it'll be interesting to do the demonstration sitting down. You can lift this up and you can wear it as a face mask. Um, you can breathe through this, even um, what I find in, on really cold days when you're um, walking, you can breathe through this quite nicely and the cold air doesn't go into your lungs. If it gets really colder, you can make it into full face by a clover. So grab this piece here and lift that over. And I'm a ninja or bella clover, so I've protected against the back, the front, and even if this is wet, it'll keep me warm. On a really hot day, I can wear it as a sweatband or headband. So just keeping the sweat out um, when it's really hot and protecting the ears from the sun. And if you've got longer hair, you can fold that all the way back in and have your hair sitting in the back. Another way of wearing it is turning it inside out. Giving it a twist and then dropping it back over itself. And there's videos on our website to show you um, and Oxfam will post this video so you can see the different ways of wearing it. So I've got a skull cap or a beanie on a really cold day early in the morning when you do a six, six o'clock start. This is a great way of wearing it. And my favorite one is lying it on your head inside out. So you grab the piece here and you flick that over. So that'll cover your neck from the sun, prevent that from getting burnt and covering your ears from getting burnt and you can still wear a cap um, or um, a big boonie hat over that but you've got your neck covered and then lastly if you're not wearing it around your head or neck you can just grab this give it a twist and put it onto your wrist as i'm showing here what's great with the product and um, what we used to do um, with a lot of this um, stops if you um, you soak it in water and then you just put it around your neck and keeps your neck cool especially when it's really hot um, so it's a really functional um, necessity products um, when you're out on the trails, um, especially when you're doing those kind of long distances. And then the other thing that I'll quickly mention, um, I know that compulsory gear is also um, um, phones. So um, we have these lock sack bags and we've got a $40 special where $15 goes back to your team page and you get two of these bags, um, lock sack bags inside. Um, the phone goes into that and um, it all works with touch screen. So I'll quickly put that in. So it looks like that. It's double sealed. I don't know if you can see that. Um, double sealed, you can do all the phoning in it. It works, your touch screen works and it'll protect you against the, um, if it's raining, um, against dust and um, any kind of um, conditions. So your phone's protected, um, which is compulsory gear. The other thing that also I want to show is run guard, um, which is also anti-chafe. So it's a natural um, plant-based um, anti-chafe. Um, what's really important um, out there is um, chafing can become a real issue, um, especially when you're doing these long distances. Um, it was mentioned, um, obviously your feet is, is the big issue. Um, so making sure um, you've got um, the rubbing that there's no blisters and that will help um, when you put um, the chafing um, anti-chafe like run guard or others on your feet um, under your arms um, if you're wearing the packs on, on the straps um, all those different places um, the run guard can help you there i think that's probably all that i was going to mention um, and if you have any questions um, yeah feel free um, to ask me um, I guess um, on my personal notes on, on Trail Walker, I did it in 2011, so it was quite a while back. Um, and one tip that I would say is um, dry feet. Um, so your feet are the most important thing. Um, they get you to the finish line. Um, just make sure your feet are constantly, um, if you have a number of pair of socks, um, keep changing your socks um, during the different checkpoints and um, make sure your feet are dry. And like Marie said last um, last week, if you have um, water, wash those feet, um, as, as John said, and um, protect your feet. Thanks very much, Kylie. Wonderful. Thank you, Marco. Who doesn't love a buff? And I was just watching um, the screen in my top right-hand corner, which says Karen, but there's a few people sitting there at a table. You know who you are. I was watching you guys 
Yes. <laughs> you guys have gone along with the buff. So that was really cool. Nice work. Um, and yeah, there are so many ways to wear them. So if you do reach your, as a team, reach your $2,000 minimum fundraising target, you will receive one of those buffs each um, at registration on the Friday, the 19th of March, just before event weekend, ready to wear um, during the event. Um, and I think this is also a good time to mention that as soon as this info session is complete, we invite you to actually head over to our Facebook page. Um, this year we're doing a little things a little bit differently. So we'd like to cast, we'd like you to cast your vote for your favorite buff design. So whichever one has the most votes by October the 31st will be the official design for the 2021 buff. So get your family, your friends and your support crew voting for your favorite design. All right, um, I think we are about to go into Q&A. Um, but just very briefly, I would like to say thank you to our quick sponsors. So we have New Plymouth District Council, Venture Taranaki, Tonkin and Taylor, Bivouac Outdoor and Booster Wine Group. And of course, special thanks to Rachel, John and Marco from Outwear for joining us this evening. So I'm going to take it away. I haven't been looking at the chat box, but if you have any questions, either come off mute or you can check type them in the chat box and Lizzie, um, our event manager who is online tonight, she's gonna help answer any questions for us for the next 10 minutes or so. So go for gold, uh, ask away, we're happy to help. Brilliant, thank you Kylie. Well, we've had um, two questions so far. So one is, is there vehicle access for support crew at checkpoints? So there will, uh, there definitely will be access um, for your support crew to drive in. Um, more specifically, where is um, up to our events and logistics operation um, operations executive, um, who is Natasha. She's online, so she can probably talk a little bit more about it tonight. Um, but we will be giving um, all of our support crew one parking pass to be as close as possible. So as your support crew come in, they can come and park, they show their pass, um, and wherever, whichever checkpoint it is, and wherever they, um, they are directed to park, uh, we just ask that the support crew uh, respectfully follow the instructions because some of the checkpoints will be marais um, and also private profit property so um, just as a general rule of thumb just to respect respect the area um, and follow the rules brilliant thank you kylie um the questions are gonna uh, are actually starting to flood in so i'll just take them as they come Go so um we've had a few questions about footwear uh and so obviously that does uh, depend on your kind of your preference um so our first recommendation will be to head to your local bivouac outdoor store where the staff are briefed to support our oxam trail walkers or alternatively check out our previous webinar which was about gear and training which you can find at oxamtrailwalker.org.nz forward slash preparation. Um, another has asked is there an average time to complete the 50 kilometers? Uh, yes there is. Uh, for 50 kilometers it's 12 to 13 hours and for the 100 kilometers it's 25 to 26 hours as average times. Uh, how much walking is required for the support crew or do they park park close to the checkpoint uh, and the answer does depend on the checkpoint itself and where they're based and obviously the, the amount of parking that's available most of the time um, and our preference is to make sure that parking for support crew is right next to the the checkpoints themselves this means that not only support crew don't have to walk all the way over to the checkpoints and lug all the stuff it also means that if our walkers have to walk to the car to get something they don't have to go that far and um, so that's a, a key point for us as well we've had someone say is there advice around nutrition for the checkpoints um yes there is so we'll be putting our kind of nutrition and hydration advice on our website uh, relatively soon we have a course drink sponsored by our line so our line is one of our long term sponsors and they are providing electrolyte drinks um, for everyone at every checkpoint and every event site and if you do want to incorporate that into your training you can head over to uh, the our line website and they have a special deal for you so that's um 20 dollars per per bottle of our line and that makes 10 litres of electrolyte drink um, and when you spend $20 they'll also put $10 onto your fundraising page as well. 
Um, if you do have any specific other questions or you are really nervous about hydration and nutrition advice, please do give us a call. Our telephone number is 0800 600 700 and we're absolutely happy to be the other end of the phone or email to give you one-on-one -on -one advice and support as well. Um, is water available at checkpoints? Yes, yes it is, both hot and cold. Um, and we also have um, fair trade uh, tea, coffee, hot chocolate and sugar as well for everyone to, to get their bit of caffeine in for them as well. And finally, as someone has asked, is the trail marked so as not to get off track? Yes, it is. So part of the, the navigation part of the trail is that you have your walker directions, which you get given on the Friday, the registration the night before. We're also going to be giving them online um, a few weeks before, um, just asking everyone to, to not pre-walk the private property sections of the trail. Um, but we'll also be marking as well, both with kind of big arrows going this way, um, but also nighttime reflective ones as well. So that brings us back to our recommendation to get a really good head torch. So that way you can pick up the, the, the reflective night marking when you're walking through the night. Uh, are tramping boots more suitable than normal running walking shoes? Um, I'm going to refer back to our previous uh, webinar there, our gear and training provider, because we had uh, Marie from Go Run Girls and also Liam from the Christchurch store of Bivouac Outdoor, who's given some really good footwear advice. Um, so do check that out. Um, otherwise, do head into Bivouac Outdoor stores. And I've rushed through all the questions that was on the, the Zoom chat. So please do throw any more in or come off mute and ask. Um, we'll give it a few more minutes. Oh, so need some water after that. <laughs> Lizzie, it's Rachel here. I'm not sure if John wants to jump in around shoes as well, but I, I found that with a team of four, we all wore slightly different shoes. Um, and that there, is bush, there was bush walk, there was beach walk, there was you know such a wide terrain in Whakatane as well. So it actually does really come down to the, the key advice is, is whatever you're wearing, make sure it's broken in, that you're comfortable with it, that you're, you like wearing them. That's your preferred one. Some people like trainers in, on the bush and some people like tramping boots on the beach so it is also quite personal but the key thing is don't wear anything new that you haven't broken in John what, what would you say um, no, I, I would agree it, it took me a little while to work out what I've preferred and the last 10 years it has been the Salomon a wide fitting shoe a trail shoe not a boot and I think I said before I, I get a size bigger than the normal like a dress shoe to allow for swelling, even though you know, you've got to manage that. I, I've found that that's been very, very good. I also have two, I'll, I'll alternate. So I, about every second checkpoint, I will not only change socks, but change my shoes. Um, don't ask me why, it's sort of psychological thing. Certainly if they get wet, there's a good reason. So for me, minimum of two pairs of shoes on the day. Okay. Fantastic. And also, yeah, we, I remember last year when we did our audit for with our team, we all wore different types of shoes. Um, and I remember I walked in with, this was the first week of my um, time at Oxfam, and I walked 70 kilometers in shoes that I had barely worn. Um, so, and they were the high tops as well. So the sides of my feet around the ankles were incredibly sore by Friday. However, it was worth it, and um, it's you've got to you've got to try the shoe beforehand. You have to make sure that it fits you. And some people quite like the high tops. I prefer the lower tops, but it again, like Rachel and John said, it's what you are comfortable in. So this is the time to try it out and test it. Go into Bivouac Outdoor, go and see people like Marco from Outwear, and talk to those professionals who who know what they're talking about and who have experienced it. Do we have any more questions that have come through, Lizzie? We haven't got any in the Zoom chat now, Kylie. No, Kylie. I, I, it's not a question, just something else that I, I wanted to say if I've got a minute. Um, so originally, my main interest was just to see if I could do this. And then I've proven that I can, which means you can all do it. But what I wanted to add was, I've actually been very fortunate to see the work of Oxfam. The last six years I've been working up in Papua New Guinea and that's sort of taken my commitment to this event almost to another level. So it's just a reminder, I mean we're all there for the physical and mental challenges but 
to know that what Oxfam are doing, certainly in Papua New Guinea, has it's been another level of motivation for me. So I just thought I'd put that out there that we're raising funds and the causes are just phenomenal. That's it. Thank you, John. That's that's really great to hear. Um, and I just want to, to bring us briefly back to the Zoom chat as we've had uh, one specific question as to, do teams or individuals pull out during the event? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, we don't want to, to force you to walk 50 or 100 kilometers when you really, really can't, um, whether it's through fatigue or blisters. Um, we're here to support you absolutely and want to see you at that finish line. Um, but yes, so what happens with retiring is that we ask individuals or teams to, to, to reach the next checkpoint where they can retire safely with their support crew um, and we'll retire an individual for example we'll mark them on the, the system um, and a team of three can carry on walking if someone else from that team of three also needs to retire the team of two can absolutely carry on but they do need to buddy up with another team that doesn't necessarily mean that they lose their identity they don't lose their bib number or team name um, but it's just another another team to walk with and we have had um, teams cross the finish line made up of individuals one from different teams um, who've who've created uh, a support network as they've walked along the trail so we'll absolutely help you get to uh, the finish line whether individually or hopefully all together all right and then i'm just going to bring questions um to a close now um we've had someone say please confirm the start and finish locations and also those stretches of different kinds of terrains um we will be releasing the trail and all that information once it's confirmed uh, at the beginning or sorry the middle to end of october and uh, we don't have that information to release at the moment unfortunately Cool, thank you, Lizzie. Um, and I think there was one question a little bit further up that you may have missed. Um, but um, there was a question from someone, how much water should you bring with us? So how much would you usually consume between checkpoints? Now this might be a question for you, John. Um, how much water do you usually consume between checkpoints? That's a real tricky one. Um, of, you know, the terrain, the elevation, the time of day, there's lots of different factors, but I normally have a litre, one, a litre to one and a half litres on me at all times. So even though the checkpoints might be 12, 15 kilometres apart and you've got water there, I'd still, you know, I, I like my own supply. And like I said, there's different factors that will impact how much you consume. Um, but dehydration is definitely, I don't know where it comes out on the on the uh, ladder of reasons for withdrawal, but it's up there. Being the top five or six, I would say. Fantastic, thank you, John. Um, and Natasha has just replied to you, your question, Alison, um, about volunteers. So you can go and check her answer out in the chat box. So we're two minutes to the end, where we'll conclude. Um, Obviously, this doesn't mean that questions have to stop. So if you have any questions and you wake up at two o'clock in the morning this morning, you go, oh, I should have asked them this question, pop it in an email, we'll get to you as soon as possible, or give us a call tomorrow and we're happy to help out. Um, and on that note, we will conclude. So remember at 7 p.m., which is in two minutes, um, head over to our Facebook and we will pop a poll up on our Facebook for the buff design. So make sure you go and do that and get your support crew and family involved. Um, and like I said, if you have any further questions, uh, feel free to send us an email or give us a call. In the meantime, stay safe, train smart, and we'll see you at the last one which is part three on October the 20th. So this one will be all about fundraising. Um, so we'll see you there. One last thank you to Rachel, John and Marco. And yeah, thank you everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks for joining.